Hello, and welcome to our ABF online service. We are so thankful that you've decided to take time out of your schedule to grow and be challenged in God's Word. Well, I've got a couple things for you. The first one is um, you are welcome to text us at 97,000 anytime to share with us any of your confidential prayer requests. As a staff team, man, we consider it a privilege to be praying for you and walking with you in whatever is going on in your life. Um, We'd love for you also to check out our website, especially for those of you that live locally. Man, we'd love for you to get involved in all the activities and events that are happening weekly on our campus. So go ahead and check out agorabible.org. Well, the last thing, everything that we do at ABF is only made possible through your generous financial gifts. Um, We would be grateful if you would just take a moment to pray and consider, man, what could you give back? Um, You can go on our website and click the Give tab if you'd like to support our ministries here at ABF. Well, now it's time for us to dive into God's Word together. Well, thank you very much, Miss Adrian. Hello, everyone. My name is Josh, one of the pastors here at the church. It's been a while since I've been up here. It is good to be back. Baby Judah is like eight weeks old. It's amazing. Life is good. Rewind. A little bit over a week ago, it was last Saturday night, 1 a.m., Lindsay was at Kaiser Woodland Hills. That's a hospital for those that aren't local. She got the bug. She's thrown up for like six straight hours. It was nasty. It just like would not stop. And we kind of got to the point of what are we going to do? She was so, so miserable. And we're like, you have to go to the hospital. Like you have to at least get an IV. They got to check you out. Uh, This is bad. And so we had my mom drive Lindsay to the hospital in the middle of the night. You may be wondering, Josh, why didn't you drive your wife to the hospital? Well, I did not feel fit to drive. I actually had gotten the exact same bug and started just a few hours before Lindsay. And so I spent two to three hours of throwing up and just ejecting every single ounce of fluids from my body. And at that point, the only thing that felt good was being curled up in the fetal position on my side and not moving a single muscle. I was miserable. It's 1 a.m. I heard Holly cry from down the hall, and I knew what her cry meant. You see, Holly was the one who kicked off the festivities earlier in the afternoon And I knew exactly what was happening. She was back for more. And so, as any father of a two-year-old that was there in my position, dealing with what I was dealing with and hearing a two-year-old down the hall dealing with what she was dealing with, what did I do? I did exactly what any other dad in my position would would do. I yelled, Holly, get to the toilet. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, uh, I hopped out of bed as quickly as I was physically able. I ran down the hall. I scooped my little baby out of bed. I ran her over to the toilet. I grabbed her hair and pulled it behind her head so that she could throw up. And I just held it there while she threw up. Man, kids sick is the absolute worst thing in the world. Most of you parents know that to be true. Uh, She continued doing her thing. I kissed her head. I told her she was doing great. At the end, I told her to spit. Why do kids want to like swallow the rest of their, it's gross, I know, but it's true. Kids are weird. Told her to spit. After she was done, I picked her back up. I just snuggled that little kiddo so much. I kissed her, put her back in her bed. Uh, For those few minutes, it didn't really register with me uh, how I was feeling. I wasn't even thinking about that. The only thing I was concerned with was comforting my little girl. And this week, as I was studying our passage on the topic of comfort, I could not help but draw the connection. I could not help but think back to last Saturday night and see a glimpse of our Heavenly Father's heart. 
of comfort. Let me pray for us, and we'll get into God's word together. Dear Lord, uh, our heavenly Father, our Dad that's up in heaven, uh, Lord, I ask that you would speak today. I ask that your word would speak, that your Holy Spirit would be moving in hearts and lives. I uh, pray that you would uh, show us your heart for wanting to comfort us in tough situations and for then what you want to use that comfort for in our lives and other people's lives. So Lord, open our hearts now to what you have for us. And I pray that we just get to know you better um, during this time. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for the chance to be sharpened and shaped here today. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, this week, we are starting a new series called Beautifully Broken. We're studying the book of 2 Corinthians. So if you would flip with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it'll be on the screen as well. If you prefer to just keep your eyes on the screen, that's fine too. Uh, if you are flipping to your, through your own Bible, let me just give you a little bit of background while you are turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So, in the Bible, there are a variety of different types of literature found within that one book. Some scripture is poetry. Some scripture is historical narrative or just really telling a story. And some scripture is letters, like people's mail to each other. Um, this book that is called 2 Corinthians is that. It's a letter. It's written by the Apostle Paul to the Jesus followers or the church in the city of Corinth. So this letter is called 2 Corinthians. However, it is not the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. A little bit of background there. So Paul helped uh, start, helped launch this church in the city of Corinth back on one of his missionary journeys. And then after that, some time later, he heard that things were not going great there in the church. And so he wrote a letter to help correct some of the issues that were going on. Then the church at Corinth responded to him with a letter. We don't have either of those first two. Uh, and then Paul responds with a second letter, which we call 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, received mixed reviews from the Corinthian church, and at that point, Paul heard that some false teachers had arrived and were stirring the pot. They were stirring the pot against uh, Paul, and so what Paul decided to do is he's going to go confront it. And so he visited in person, and that visit also did not go well. It's referred to as the painful visit. After the painful visit, Paul left and he decided to write another letter. Uh, apparently, he was, did not pull any punches. It's known as the severe letter. Paul himself describes it as being sent with anguish and tears. We do not have that letter either. But yet, at that point, it seems most of the Corinthian church kind of changed their tune, came back, and wanted to reconcile with Paul. And so Paul wrote this letter, 2 Corinthians, his fourth letter that he's written overall, but the letter that we call 2 Corinthians and the one that we have in the Bible today. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians with a few purposes in mind. One, he wanted to reconcile with the people because he had heard that the Corinthian church was wanting to reconcile with him. He wanted to speak against the false teachers, and then he taught on various other issues as well. Let's get into it. You'll kind of see uh, at least how it starts off. Verse 1, we see a greeting. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I was, uh, I don't know, contemplating this week, I was wondering how many of you wrote a physical letter, like with paper and pen, this past year in the year 2023. I'm assuming not many of you. I'm going to guess like 1%. One out of every 100 of you wrote a physical letter to somebody else in the entire year of 2023. If you did, if you are that one person that wrote a letter, uh, well done. 
Um, I think it's still kind of cool. I don't know. I'm not as hyped about it as some people are. Um, but my guess is that when you signed your name, you signed your name at the very end of the letter. You wrote your entire letter, and then you signed your name at the end. That's kind of how we do it uh, today. But for Bible study purposes, I actually really appreciate the ancient Near Eastern letter writing etiquette. Uh, it was different. Right out of the gate, the writer would identify themselves and the audience. And it's here that uh, we learned that this letter was written by Paul which, by the way, he's writing uh, on behalf of himself and Timothy. That's going to come up in a little bit because you'll see that he uses uh, plural language. He uses the words we and us a lot. That's on behalf of himself and Timothy. And I already mentioned the intended audience is the church at Corinth. So other pieces of information there that are just... Uh, Maybe interesting, maybe important, um, but I'm going to share them with you regardless. Uh, I think it's pretty fairly intuitive, but Achaia uh, is simply the surrounding region. Uh, technically, it was a Roman province, which included southern and central Greece. And I'm wondering if any of you know the capital of the ancient area of Achaia. Anyone? I'm guessing you do. It's not a trick question. It's Corinth. Corinth was the capital. Okay, there you go. And then Paul includes his standard greeting, which he literally includes in every single letter that he writes that we have in Scripture, grace and peace. Grace and peace to you. And I was thinking about it. Man, I, I understand why Paul uses that as his kind of standard greeting. It's great, right? It's great. Grace and peace are fantastic to wish for anyone and everyone in any situation. However, if you think about the context of why Paul is writing and who he's writing to here, man, it even hits home and makes even more sense. As mentioned, there's been tension between Paul and the Corinthians. False teachers have been doing their thing, poisoning the Corinthians against Paul. And one of their false teachings is this. One of the false teachings that's been spreading around is that all of the hardships that Paul has experienced, and he's going to get into that later in this letter, specifically in chapter 11, uh, the false teachers are saying that all of those hardships that he's been experiencing is divine punishment. That's God punishing Paul. Paul cannot be an apostle. He's receiving punishment from the Lord. And so Paul's reply here, even at the beginning of the letter, is that God is not punishing Paul with all of his hardships in the past. He's not. Actually, on the contrary, God has been comforting Paul in the midst of him. Let's continue reading and see how our Heavenly Father's heart of comfort uh, played out for Paul and see how he uses it, uh, comfort in the life of Paul and therefore how he uses it in our lives as well. Keep reading. Verse number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. The word comfort's in there a lot, I know. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think I could come up with a much more fluffy, flowery, bible -y sentence than that, right? Is that just a transitional line? Like, why does Paul say that here? Like, is he just transitioning? Like, it's a greeting. Okay, now I need something that sounds really, like, religious and bible -y. Like, is it just, doesn't really mean anything. He's just got to say something because I want to, like, sound good and apostle -y, and then let's just move on. Is he just saying it because uh, he's got, I don't know, his theology is a little messed up, and he's kind of putting himself in a higher position, elevating himself. Um, look, I'm going to bless the Lord. Um, I'm an apostle. I bless the Lord. Yes, I am able to bless the Lord. Um, have you ever thought about what it means to bless the Lord? I'm not going to lie to you. 
uh, this actually used to really, really bug me. Whenever there was talking about blessing the Lord or like even singing about blessing the Lord, uh, it used to really bug me. I just thought I can't bless the Lord with anything. The Lord is the one who blesses, right? Think about it. He gives blessing. He brings good things into our lives. He gives the blessing. How can I bless almighty God? Anyone else ever thought that? So on one hand, it is true God is the ultimate source of blessing. He brings all good things uh, into our lives. Uh, we cannot bless God the same way that he blesses us. However, uh, that is not what this word for blessed here in verse 3 is referring to. Uh, the Greek word that's used here literally means to speak well of. To speak well well of. Can I speak well of God? Can Paul speak well of God? Absolutely, I hope so. That's about the only thing we have to offer God. Here in verse 3, Paul is not placing himself above God. He's not. Essentially, what he's saying is God is so good, he is worthy to be spoken well of, and so I speak well of the Lord. And then he continues with his reasons for blessing, his reasons for speaking well of the Lord. I have reason to speak well of the Lord. Listen, is basically what he's saying here. God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction. I will speak well of him because he is the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction. God is the source of comfort in any and every situation in life. I have one single funeral message. Uh, if you come to, I mean, Lord willing, you're not coming to a lot of funerals that I do. Lord willing, I'm not doing a lot of funerals. Um, but if you come to multiple funerals, you will hear the same message. And in that message, I share a story that I have shared in this room before. Uh, it's a story back from October of 2019. My wife and I were in a hospital room holding the body of our son, JJ, who had just passed away. We were listening to worship music and crying there in the hospital. And out of nowhere, we were overwhelmed by a flood of comfort. Uh, we're sitting there, and Lindsay literally said this out loud. She said, I don't think I've ever felt this at peace before in my entire life. In one of the hardest situations in life, we're sitting there, and she says, I don't think I've ever felt as much peace as I feel right now. I continue in that message and say, that peace and that comfort that we experienced there in the moment, that moment, didn't last forever. But there is something that the Lord does around the death of a loved one he pulls back the veil of heaven and gives us a little taste of heaven on earth, even if it's just for a moment. Again, that taste doesn't last forever. This overwhelming comfort is not a continual 100% of the time thing, but it is recurring. Continually, regularly, we need to go back to him, the source of comfort. And I continue on in the message. God is the source of comfort in any and every situation in life. Like a dad with a vomiting toddler at one in the morning, he absolutely loves to comfort us. But his comfort also serves another purpose. Look back to verse four. He's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that, so that, we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. The supernatural, divine comfort that we receive is not just for ourselves. It is to be shared. It is to be shared with others. Uh, there aren't really any silver linings uh, I think I've probably even said this before. There really aren't any silver linings to us losing our son. We still miss him. We still wish he was here with us uh, very regularly. Uh, the only thing that could come even remotely close uh, to even resembling a silver lining is being able to share the comfort that we received from God in that moment and in the moments and months that followed with others. That's it. That's the only silver lining-ish that I could point to out of the whole thing. 
Uh, I'm sure you've noticed, if you've ever gone through something hard, that it gives you this ability to be there for others that are going through that same thing that otherwise you would not have that ability to be there for them. You just wouldn't. It kind of opens the door for you to be able to be there for people in a way that you otherwise would never have that chance. We absolutely have seen that to be true. But here's the thing. It's even bigger than that. Look back at verse four again. It says, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So that we can comfort those in any affliction. If you've been comforted by God before, you know how good and how necessary it is. And regardless on if you experience the exact same thing as someone else, if you have experienced supernatural, divine, doesn't make sense comfort from the Lord, you can point people back to that comfort. Continuing on in verse five. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. If the previous section broadly covered receiving divine comfort in any and all afflictions, these verses here, verses five through seven, speak to affliction and suffering specifically for following Jesus. As you know, and as I have even preached on fairly recently about, uh, the good news of Jesus is offensive. Just all by itself, uh, it is offen offensive. Simply taking a stand for Jesus will bring suffering uh, to some extent. It will. And so what Paul is saying here is he's saying that he and Timothy, remember when you're hearing all of these we's and us's, that's referring to Paul and Timothy. Uh, let's keep it in context. That helps us read uh, what he's trying to say. Paul is saying that he and Timothy are willing to suffer for Jesus because they know what will come out of it. Paul's saying right here in this passage, uh, by him suffering for Jesus, for he and by he and Timothy suffering for Jesus, what's going to come out of it is comfort for them, comfort for the Corinthian church and people coming to a saving relationship with Jesus. Their suffering for Jesus would bring other people to the Lord. Now, uh, the we language that's used in here, we, whenever you see the word we, uh, absolutely important to remind ourselves of context. However, the positive of having it uh, in the we language, I feel like it makes it so easy for us to associate with. Like it just kind of brings you in, right? As you're reading it, you, when, you're, when you're reading we, you're just like including yourself in there, right? And I think that's a beautiful thing because I think it's absolutely applicable and there's a cool way where it's supposed to kind of draw us in in that regard as well. For us today, it is important to regularly remind ourselves that suffering and persecution for following Jesus is to be expected, number one. But two, it is sometimes a necessary, necessary step for others to come to a saving relationship with Jesus. And what do I mean by that? I'll share one angle. I think there's a couple of different angles, but I'm just gonna share one angle for the sake of time. One angle, what I think that means. There is a risk associated with sharing the good news of Jesus. There is a risk. In different places around the world, there is a very real physical risk. Could be imprisoned, beaten, uh, etc. In America, not so much the physical risk. However, there is absolutely a social risk. There is a risk of rejection. Putting yourself out there, claiming boldly what Jesus has done in your life and how he can change other people's lives, there is a social risk involved with that. Uh, it's not a bad thing. It's just what it is. Um, either way, 
being willing to put yourself out there, whether there is physical risk or social risk or risk of rejection or whatever risk is out there, being willing to do that and boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus will be encouraging and comforting for other followers of Jesus. And it has the possibility of saving the souls of those who don't yet follow Jesus. It is a powerful, powerful thing. All right, let's wrap up the last section, verse eight. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many, excuse me, many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. All right. Here in this last section, uh, Paul reminded the church of a really, really, really difficult situation that he experienced back in Asia. Uh, apparently the Corinthians generally knew what he was talking about because here we can see that he doesn't really give us many details. And so unfortunately for us as the readers now, we don't really know the exact situation of what he's talking about. Um, but despite the fact that the Corinthians knew about the situation, clearly they didn't fully understand the impact, the deep impact that that situation had on Paul and Timothy. Read how Paul describes it in verses eight and nine. He said, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. We despaired of life itself. We felt that we had received the sentence of death. Man, have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been so burdened by a situation that it was just all consuming? Can't eat, can't sleep, stomach just feels miserable. Somehow you physically are hurting even though it's nothing physical that's going on. Just wanna cry, curl up in a ball. Do I really have to keep on going with my day? When will all of this end. I can count on one hand uh, the scenarios in my life that have been that miserable because Paul is, re I mean, he's describing a horrible, horrible situation. Uh, it's absolutely miserable. As I've kind of, I don't know, just been doing even a little processing, I feel like there's an ironic part to it where when I find myself in a situation like that, my initial kind of gut reaction can be a couple of things. I can question God. I can go so far as to doubt God, like, man, this is gonna go so bad. I can be angry, frustrated, et cetera, et cetera. But what Paul is saying here about his situation like that, now that he's had a little bit of time and he's looking back with some perspective, when he recounts that miserable, miserable place that he was in, is that it was there to make he and Timothy rely not on themselves, but on God. The reason was for him to not rely on himself, but to rely on God. And honestly, what other choice do you have when you find yourself in a situation like that? I would imagine as you're sitting here, if you are a follower of Jesus, chances are you agree. You're like, yes, I agree. That is, that is a well-made point. I do not disagree with that scripture or that thought. But man, when we actually find ourselves in that situation, we just need to be reminded of it. Don't rely on yourself. Rely on God. What does that mean? What does that even look like? What does it look like to rely on God? I think here we see a couple of things. It looks like remembering. It looks like trusting. It looks like hope. Remembering. He is the miracle worker. 
Read there in the text. He is the one who raises the dead. He has delivered us from deadly peril and can deliver us again. Man, it is trust. It is trusting him. It is quite possible that the Lord has orchestrated all of it, even the miserable circumstance that you find yourself in, so that he can bring about his glory, so that he can do work in people's lives that he needs to do, so that he can bring about justice, so that he can move things around, so that he can change us and shape us and mold us. It might not even be for you. It might be for somebody else, but yet you're part of it because we're community and all, all these things are working together. You have no idea what the Lord is doing behind the scenes, but it is quite possible that he is orchestrating all these things to accomplish his greater purpose in life. And here is the thing though. Let me assure you, if the living God is on the move, absolutely no situation in this world is beyond hope. There is zero situation in this world that is beyond hope. We should absolutely have hope. Uh, Paul uh, calls the Corinthians, have hope. Have hope. It doesn't matter. You today, in your situation, regardless of how bad that relationship is, regardless of the health thing that is going on, regardless of any situation that you might find yourself in, if the living God is there, there is more than a possibility of redemption. That is what he does. He is the miracle worker. I'm telling you, I've seen it. He is the God of miracles who raises the dead and can do it again. That is the truth that Paul is pointing them back to. But here's the thing, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't do it in the way that you want him to do it, even if God doesn't show up and do the exact miracle and, and close out the situation and wrap it all up exactly how you want him to wrap it up, he is still trustworthy. He is still trustworthy because he will still bring comfort and he will still, still, still sustain even if it doesn't go the way that you want it to go. I have been in situations where I would describe like this, this gut-wrenching, and I've seen both sides. I've seen him come through the way that I didn't think there's no way he's going to come through. I've seen him not answer the way that I wanted him to come through, but yet I've seen his comfort and he sustained me through it. There is no doubt that both of those are true. Paul went on to be executed just a few years later. And look at what he wrote to Timothy shortly before his execution. We have it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Here in this situation, you could argue in a situation that is way worse, it's going to end worse than his previous, previous one did, but at this point, he is not utterly burdened anymore. This situation... Uh, even though it ends way worse, man, does he have the Lord's comfort or what? He's ready. Pretty incredible. As we close out our time together, I think it's wise to close out uh, by taking a look at the very last verse in our section. And he closes with verse 11, verse 11 saying, you also must help us by prayer. Talking about one of the most tough situations in life, you also must help us by prayer. Why? Because prayer works. Can I pray for you right now? Dear Father, uh, thank you that you are our heavenly Father, um, that you love us like a dad, um, that you just love to comfort us. Uh, Lord, I pray for anyone out there that is just in a situation that just needs your divine, supernatural, unexplainable comfort. Lord, I pray that you would come and hold us and wrap us up and uh, hold us tight and uh, comfort us like only you can comfort us. Um, Lord, I pray for those that find themselves in that situation today, utterly burdened, despairing of life, don't want to go on. It, I, how can I deal with this for another day? 
Lord, I pray for those um, that have relationships that are just a mess and it's just messing people up day in and day out, day in and day out, just can't, nothing else on their mind, can't eat. It's just absolutely a mess. Lord, I pray that you would intervene. God, I pray for a softness, for a humility. I ask for grace. I ask for time in your word. I ask that your word would speak. Your Holy Spirit would draw so near. God, you're the God of miracles. You bring dead things to life. We've seen it. We know that you're good. And so, Lord, I ask desperately in the name of Jesus that you would act. God, I pray for those health situations that are out there um, that seem impossible. God, you are the miracle worker. You heal uh, and it is not a hard thing for you. God, I ask um, that you would heal. Lord, I ask that you'd give us great faith, that you'd give us great trust. Uh, Lord, that you would bring your comfort. Uh, we trust you no matter what. Um, God, thank you very much for your word. Thank you for how you're moving and working um, everywhere uh, right now, even as we're uh, listening to this video, God. Uh, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We love you. Praise in Jesus' name.